Okay, next, coherence length. Why does the contrast we observe in second harmonic generation not just depend on the SHG and inherent SHG activity of the sample itself at the molecular level? A lot of that uh, contrast actually comes from the physical extent of the sample, which manifests in terms of the coherence length. And it turns out that the contrast can be quite different if we're measuring things in the forward transmission direction or in the backward epi direction. And that ratio provides a, a molecular, or not a molecular level, but a, a, a nanometric level scale bar for us in terms of the, the thickness of the sample that's contributing to the, to the detected signal. All right, our agenda today is to, first of all, see if we can come up with a nice conceptual understanding of what phase matching really means. Uh, why is it different in the two different directions? And then how do we use that to our advantage to be able to say something meaningful about the thickness of the sample from forward and backward ratio measurements? <clears throat> so let's consider a beam propagating from left to right here. And we're, we, uh, it's essentially a plane wave. We're, we're doing this everything within the paraxial approximation such that we don't have to worry about high NA optics here. So this plane wave propagating through the focal volume, there's, it turns out there's a specific phase relationship. If we just look at this one slice generated right here, at, at, as soon as, let's say we have a bulk medium that goes from zero to this distance. Then at this very first slice of, of material, we have a, a specific phase relationship between the second harmonic that we produce and the square of the fundamental driving field, because it's the square of the fundamental that ultimately is, is going to be producing the second harmonic generation response. And there's going to be some phase relationship. They don't necessarily have to be identically in phase, but there's going to be a fixed phase relationship between those two at that, for that initial slice. And now if we think about the next slice that adds and the next slice that adds and think about the net second harmonic generation as being the coherent summation over all these uh, little slices, then it turns out that, uh, that there's, everything's fine early on, right? We get nice coherent addition between these waves in both the fundamental squared and the second harmonic generation. But in any realistic practical medium, we have dispersion such that the refractive index is going to be different for the doubled frequency than it will be for the fundamental. And as a result, then typically the doubled frequency is a, has a higher refractive index and propagates more slowly. As a result, you end up with a phase lag between the two, a phase shift between the two, such that if you propagate long enough, you end up with a situation where the phase relationship actually inverts. And now the next slab, infinitesimal slab of SHG produce, produces signal that is 180 degrees out of phase with everything that had been produced previous to it. And so now you end up with destructive interference and actually shifting of energy from the doubled frequency beam back to the fundamental because of this destructive interference. And that results in um, this oscillation in the intensity as well as the phase shift between the square of the fundamental and the doubled frequency, they go hand in hand. And so you see oscillations in the intensity that have to do with this coherence length, the, the, uh, in a, that, that have a period of the coherence length. Uh, and it makes sense in hindsight that it's going to be due, due to this refractive index difference that's gonna play a role in dictating the coherence length in the forward generation. And it's also gonna be related to the wavelength of light. And those things all sort of intuitively make sense. It turns out this is a fairly straightforward expression that connects and calculates the, the extent over which the material will go from positive to negative interference. And it's given by this simple analytical expression. Um, yeah. Now, let's consider the backward generated. So we're coming in with the fundamental. Um, actually, let's do this. Let's do it right. Let's come in with the fundamental. And then we're now detecting the doubled light that's coming back this way. And so now we have the doubled frequency coming this direction and the fundamental going in the opposite direction. Well, you can imagine that if you have a beam that's propagating, if, if these two beams are, are propagating in opposite directions, they're gonna walk out of phase very quickly with respect to each other because now they're actually traveling in opposite directions. That won't be exact. It won't be uh, if we still have an infinitesimal sheet, then uh, then we're still all good in the sense that that one thin sheet won't care which way the beam is propagating. It's just going to be a dipole that radiates in both directions. But as soon as you start having a spatial extent to that dipole that radiates in both directions, it's going to be easier for it to maintain coherence with the forward propagating beam 
then it will be in the epi direction. So the coherence length is much shorter and that shows up by the fact that you have a sum in the denominator for the refractive indices as opposed to a difference. And that makes a big, big difference because if you've got um, two refractive indices, usually as long as the dispersion is not all that great, that refractive index difference doesn't, have, doesn't generally have to be all that great. And so you're now dividing by a small number, which makes the forward coherence length generally a much larger number than the backward coherence length. How can we use this to our advantage? Well, if we, if we measure from a thin sheet, then the forward and backward generated SHG are going to be equal because the spatial extent of the sample is much less than either coherence length, and so it generates equal contributions in both directions. However, as the th simple thickness approaches the backwards coherence length, then transmission will win out. And so that provides us with a bit of a ruler. If we know the backwards coherence length, then at the point at which transmission is favored relative to epi-detected SHG, then that gives us sort of a, a scale bar to say that, oh, well, the sample must have been on the order of the backward coherence length in thickness if forward, transmit, forward transmitted SHG is now much brighter than the epi-detected. What about phase matching? So let's consider the scenario where the refractive index of the doubled frequency is exactly equal to the refractive index of the fundamental. Now, what would it take to make that happen? Well, normally, because of dispersion, the refractive index of the doubled frequency is typically going to be higher than that of the fundamental. But if you have a birefringent medium, then now you have a difference in refractive index, index for different polarizations of light. So if you look along a, 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 an optical axis, it has a large refractive index for both 2 omega and omega, and then compare that with another optical axis that has a smaller refractive index, you might find a scenario where the fundamental at, at the high index axis is equal to the uh, doubled refractive index on the low refra refractive index maxed, matched axis, such that by refringence, happens to be able to exactly counteract this, this dispersion effect. And in the limit of, of birefringence counteracting dispersion, you end up with the, den with the denominator here approaching zero, or the co forward coherence length approaching infinity. Um, and so this is actually why, if you're doing second harmonic generation for a, 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 for a, a femtosecond pulse or for a, a Q-switch diag with a crystal, you have to tune things to get the to get phase matching to arise such that this denominator approaches zero and the entire bulk extent of the crystal contributes to the frequency doubling for frequency conversion. In microscopy, however, things can be a bit different. Our effective interaction length can be limited by things other than the forward coherence length. So if you if you have a collimated beam going through a crystal and you're trying to get high efficiency of doubled frequency in an optical path, you want your coherence length to be um, infinite. But in a, and you'd love that if you're trying to do microscopy to sample as well, but it turns out that the effective interaction length, if you're doing light measurements with a highly focused beam, and by high, I mean anything there than 0.3 NA, if you're doing, I guess that's a 20 micron field of view, depth of field rather, and it typically, in this case, the, the depth of field that can limit the interaction volume, the, the volume of the material that ultimately contributes to the bulk detected SHG. It can, be, it can be limited by many things. It can be limited by the forward coherence length. It can be limited by the depth of field. Or if you have something that's scattering and highly turbid, this, the, the total scattering length can also potentially play a role in dictating the, the, the volume of material that effectively contributes to the SHG that's detected. So phase matching matters arguably more in collimated measurements, measurements with collimated sources and for, for frequency conversion of, uh, of optical beams than it does for microscopy where you have a fairly narrow depth of field. All right, that takes me to the end.